Thank you for joining us and welcome to another edition of Answers Network. I'm your host, Alan Cardoza, and today coming to you live from my son's office. It's a long story. Anyway, for those of you that have been listening, sending in questions and comments, thank you so much. And please continue to help spread the word that every Monday from 11 a.m. to noon Pacific time, this show will bring on special guests that can inspire, educate, and in some cases entertain while bringing answers and options to making our lives happier, healthier, and more successful. And if you can't listen live, go to our website at answers.network and browse through a variety of heartfelt topics. Now, I would also really appreciate it if you would all forward at least one of our shows to your social media group or to someone you know who benefit from a particular subject. This is one powerful way that we, together, can make a positive inference on the world. Now, our question is, why do some people who experience the worst that life has to offer respond not by breaking down, but by shifting up into a higher functioning state? And perhaps, more importantly, how can we emulate that transformation? Well, our guest, Steve Taylor, PhD, is the author of Extraordinary Awakenings and many other best-selling books. He is a senior lecturer in psychology at Leeds Beckett University and the chair of the transpersonal psychology section of the British Psychological Society. Steve's articles and essays have been published in over 100 academic journals, magazines, and newspapers, and he also blogs for Scientific American and Psychology Today. So Steve, welcome to Answers Network. Hi, Alan. Great to be with you. Well, it is my pleasure. Um, now, what time is it where you're at? It's um, quite late. It's seven o'clock, just after seven o'clock in the evening. So it's seven quite dark. And cold. <laughs> well, um, and I, I appreciate you joining us and taking this time. Uh, I've been talking to some people about the fact that we were going to have you on the show, and there was some interesting questions in regards to the title. So tell us a little bit about the title of the new book, Extraordinary Awakenings, and what, what was your inspiration, not only to write it, but to come up with that title? It came from my research as a psychologist. Um, well, even before that, it came from my own experiences, really, because when I was um, a teenager, beginning when I was a teenager, I started to have what I now understand to be spiritual experiences, you know, feelings of connection to my surroundings and feelings of uh, being uplifted, feelings of euphoria. And I didn't understand the experiences at the time but years later when I became a psychologist I wanted to do I, w I wanted to kind of do research on these experiences and find out how common they were and what gave rise to them and I found out that one of the most significant triggers of spiritual experiences or moments of expansion or peak mm -hmm. experiences is psychological turmoil right. um, so depression uh, bereavement you know addiction and so on and I, and I also began to find that a lot of the people who had sp uh, temporary spiritual experiences in the, in the midst of psychological turmoil, they reported being permanently changed, not returning to a normal state of consciousness, but being changed in a very fundamental and permanent way. So I began to do research on, you know, and I, find, I found some really amazing stories about people who were diagnosed with cancer, people who were addicts for many years, mm -hmm. prisoners, soldiers, and so on. You know, many, I mean, they, they, these are extraordinary awakenings because they, they occur in extraordinary circumstances. Now, um, if you can, I mean, give us a comparison. You talk about the, the transformation through turmoil, but what, how, would, how does that compare with um, post-traumatic growth? It's similar, but what I call transformation through turmoil is a much more dramatic and extreme kind of post-traumatic growth. It often occurs very suddenly and dramatically, whereas post-traumatic growth is normally very gradual and very long-term. But transformation through turmoil usually occurs in a sudden moment, well, often, often a, moment of, a moment of acceptance or surrender. Um, and people are changed in a much more fundamental an essential way than in post-traumatic growth. People literally feel that they are a different person. The, the change is so dramatic. They feel like they are a different person living in the same body. Mm -hmm. 
And what sort of turmoil did you, did you go through and and how quickly did you recognize your own transformation? Me, me personally? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good question. Well, for me personally, um, I mentioned earlier when I was a teenager, I had yeah. spiritual experiences, but that was a time of turmoil for me. I was very depressed as a teenager. I felt very alienated from other people. I didn't understand myself at all. So I, I felt very confused. So I, I, I think that in retrospect, my own spiritual experiences were connected to the, the depression I went through as a teenager. And it lasted for quite a long time. You know, it began when I was a teen teenager, but it lasted intermittently for about 10 years, you know, before I became, you know, you know, a, a fairly contented and stable person, which I have remained, fortunately. Well, define what you mean by some of your spiritual experiences and, and how that connects to turmoil. Well, I would define a spiritual experience in quite simple terms, really. I would say that a spiritual experience is a moment or an experience of expansion and connection. It's an experience in which your awareness intensifies and expands so the, the world around you becomes more real, more beautiful, more fascinating, almost as if a veil of familiarity is slipped away and you're seeing things as they really are. Mm -hmm. So that's one way in which awareness intensifies. But there's also, there's also an enhanced subjective awareness. So you become aware of your own being in a, in a more powerful way. So you have this kind of more, more enriched inner life, if you like. But you also connect with other people. Your awareness intensifies in terms of your connections with other people. Uh, and also you have a, a wider, more global vision of reality, vision of the world. So moments of depression, such as my own experiences, or any period of intense turmoil can serve as a kind of... Um, it's a kind of, it, 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 can, it can create a shift, like a jolt, which shifts you out of your normal consciousness into this expansive, more, more, more expansive awareness. And that can also happen on a permanent basis too. Now, do you find uh, now with us going through the, this, whatever we call it, this, this COVID pandemic or whatever, do you find that there are much more people um, going through this or at least much more people in need of a transformation i it's difficult to say but i believe that a lot of people are having temporary spiritual experiences they're glimpsing a deeper level of their own being through the the simplicity and the the quietness of life at the moment you know if you're living under a lockdown life becomes very narrow and very simple mm -hmm. very restricted and that, that can be difficult to deal with, but it can also, you know, bring a sense of inwardness. It can connect you with your own being. And it can also bring you an appreciation of the simple things in life, you know, the things that we take for granted, like life itself. Yeah. So I think a lot of people are having those kind of experiences, that moments of appreciation, moments of connection with their own being. Yeah, we, we had somebody that uh, had contacted us after one of our shows, it's probably now been six months ago, uh, that had a very positive uh, look at things. And they said that their family hadn't had uh, dinners at home with having everybody at home at the same time in years. And they yeah. said all, all of a sudden they have, and they had children that were in school, but now with everybody, you know, doing school on, on Zoom or, you know, whatever, uh, you know, that that they were finding the beauty in what was going on and the closeness that they were becoming um, mm. over something that, you know, was obviously very horrible for many others. Yeah, I think there has been a degree of post-traumatic growth, even on a communal level, you know, um, like where I live, for example, our neighborhood became much more interconnected. There was a real sense of community spirit, mm -hmm. which has never really faded away, you know, so I think it's very common actually crises even natural disasters and um, you know earthquakes and floods and that that uh, things of that of that sort they can 
bind communities together more closely. They can almost shift the community up to a higher level of integration. So and that's a form of communal post-traumatic growth. So hopefully now that will even happen on a global level. Hopefully there'll be some sort of global post-traumatic yeah, I, growth. I, well, and I couldn't agree more. And I'm also hoping that on a global level that we can start you know, uh, seeing things more eye to eye and realizing that there are things out there that can happen that affect all of us. Um, yeah. You know, you know, not this this focus on, well, whatever's going on, it's only affecting them. No, this yeah. is going on and it's affecting everybody. And if we start to look at things like that, I think we'll find solutions that are better for everybody as well. I agree. I, I think, well, I mean, well, this actually connects with my book because one mm -hmm. of the changes which people undergo after a spiritual awakening as, as i mentioned before they have a more global outlook they see the world in terms not in terms of countries or nationalities but in terms of just one world and one species so they move beyond the the illusions of nationality and um you know ethnicity towards a more global perspective i think maybe the pandemic has done that too yeah well we have we have a question that's coming in and again, I want to thank those people that take the time to send in questions, comments, because uh, this is really how, you know, how we communicate with you. So if you have questions uh, and you're not in a position to be able to call in or, or to send in a message during the show, a question like this has come in just before the show. And this one reads, um, my father was one of those rare people who believed that life was a safari. He used to say to us, no safari worth taking um, uh, that is not without its dense jungles, swamps, tigers, crocodiles, and pesky mosquitoes. He reminded us that regardless of the difficult times we might go through, we should transform to a better version of ourselves and never lose our inspiration and excitement for the journey because we hit a few obstacles along the way. He says, I can't wait to share your book with him as he is one of the they have in quotes shifters you speak about. Uh, I am buying a copy uh, for him for Christmas, and this is from <laughs> Beverly in um, in Minneapolis. Wow! Thanks, Beverly. That's that's beautiful. Yeah, <laughs> I, it's. Uh, I think you know, human beings. We are quite paradoxical in many ways, but one way in which we are paradoxical is that we we yearn for safety and comfort and security. But there's another part of us which yearns for adventure and challenge and, and difficulty. Mm -hmm. And we actually only grow through following that part of us, you know, the part of us which longs for challenge and adventure. Because, you know, we only really find out how powerful we are, how strong we are until we're faced with challenges. You know, if your life is always easy, then you don't really, you only really scratch the surface of your potential. But when yeah. you go through challenges, then you realize how much resilience there is inside you. I mean, all of, the, all of the people I, I wrote about in the book, they went through really terrible situations in their lives, really deep suffering. Right. But they found, you know, this in, these incredible reserves of resilience inside them, which brought about transformation. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Beverly mentioned uh, the term shifters, which was something I hadn't uh, I hadn't thought of in that term until until reading your book. So. Uh, in, and in the book, you share the stories of these shifters who responded to tremendously difficult life experiences um, and not by breaking down, but by shifting up to a higher functioning, awakened state. How did you find the individuals you interviewed for your book? I, I often find when I write books that things fall into place very easily. It's almost as if, you know, things gravitate towards me, the things that I'm meant to write about kind of fall into my lap. And it was a bit like that. People, people who'd read my previous books contacted me and said, oh, I've had this amazing experience. You know, can I tell you about it? And I found out that they were shifters who'd been through, you know, many years of addiction or who, who had been diagnosed with cancer. So a lot of people came to me that way. Other people were recommended to me. You know, people said to me, oh, wow, you, you need to speak to this guy. He's, he's had this amazing spiritual transformation. Mm -hmm. um, but also... I have a role as a psychologist, um, so I do research. And uh, about three years ago, I did a research project on, on bereavement, mm -hmm. which focused on the transformational power of, of, you know, in the aftermath of bereavement. And I found a lot of cases where people would undergo a spiritual transformation 
in the, you know in, in the grief amidst the grief of losing some losing somebody they loved so a few people came that way came from that source as well mm -hmm. so um what are some examples of the types of turmoil that uh, these shifters that you write about experienced before their awakening one um major source uh, was um, imprisonment or incarceration. I found so many examples of that that I had to devote two chapters of the book to it. I couldn't narrow it down to one chapter. So I, I found a lot of historical examples, particularly from places like um, the Soviet gulags in the oh. 1950s or 60s, when you know Soviet dissidents were living under really, in situations of really extreme suffering at minus 30 degrees in Siberia, a very poor diet, torture you know and extreme extreme deprivation of, of all kinds but in you know in in the in these situations <clears throat> they would find a very strange power inside themselves they sometimes called it soul force it was a kind of like an inner light or an inner power which only emerged when they were you know in a state of extreme deprivation when they were incredibly hungry when they were seriously ill, when they were close to death, this strange soul power would emerge inside them and keep them alive, keep them warm through the winter, keep them alive even though they had, they were eating very little, and keep them healthy mm -hmm. even though you know they were in terrible, you know, even though they had been seriously ill. And I also found examples from the concentration camps in the Second World War, similar examples, but also many contemporary examples of prisoners. Who had undergone transformation in the in the uk there's actually an organization called the prison phoenix trust which mm. supports spiritual development in prisoners no, it's nothing it's not religious it's it's based on meditation they teach meditation in prison and also yoga classes but mainly they they support prisoners who are undergoing spiritual development and um you know that i, I found some examples through through the prison uh, prison phoenix trust as well but I think prison is really interesting because, um, you know, it's about letting go. When you go to prison, you let go of everything. Everything which gives you an identity is outside the prison walls. So inside the prison, you are not the person you were outside. You know, you lose your, your possessions, your status, your relationships. Everything is taken away. So in the process of losing everything, you find something deeper you know, you find a spiritual aspect of your own being. Yeah, I would think that one of the most famous examples of that would be Nelson Mandela. I think so. Yeah, I do mention him in the book. Mm -hmm. um, another another famous example is um, an Indian philosopher called Sri Aurobindo. Mm -hmm. He was, uh, he, he's, he's, maybe he's not so well known, but he's, he's one of the most, um, in my opinion, he's one of the most profound spiritual authors of all time. But he was originally a, uh, a, polit a political activist who was protesting against the British colonial system in India. And he was in prison because of his polit political activism. But in prison, he had the, a powerful spiritual awakening, which changed everything. You know, he, he lost his interest in politics and became interested in spirituality. Oh, that's great. Um, so let's let's talk a little bit more about the, the the high functioning state that shifters have achieved and um how would you suggest people access that for just the average person not to where we have um gone through something so incredibly traumatic um but just to just to shift to a higher function you know we're you know for, for the person the majority of people, they're, they're out there, they're hardworking, they're raising their family, um, but things are a little tough. Hmm. Um, you know, are, are there some things that we can all do to raise hmm. that level to a point in which, you know, it can help all of us? Definitely. Yeah, that, that's one of the, you know, the purposes of my book, to find out what we can learn from the shifters and what we can apply to our own lives and to our own personal development. So there are two areas really which I emphasize. One is that um, when when challenges or crises arise in our lives, which they do from time to time, it's inevitable. We should respond to them in the in the right way, so that we can harness the transformational potential of these events. Because there's always some 
transformational transformational potential in negative events in, in in all psychological turmoil but the important thing that I, i've learned from from the shift is is that you have to face these situations with an attitude of acknowledgement first of all and acceptance if you resist or divert yourself from the situation then you won't undergo growth or transformation so you have to acknowledge the full reality of the situation the full enormity even if you're diagnosed with a serious illness even if a, a loved one has died you have to acknowledge the reality of it the enormity of it and contemplate what it means and how it's changed your life mm-hmm. and then i think it's also important to to go inside yourself and explore how you feel rather than sort of diverting yourself from the inside that's important but the most important aspect is acceptance it's sort of you know opening yourself to the the situation embracing it even if it's painful you embrace it and you in a sense you become one with it you know you you become one with every aspect of your life including that situation mm-hmm. that's so that's those are, that's a very important uh, aspect of it now but also um you know if you if you analyze the changes that people go through in the midst of extreme suffering the transformation that people go through you can ad- identify certain factors which are important and one of them is um that people detach themselves from things that they depended on a bit like we were saying about prisoners mm-hmm. you know in normal life we get our sense of identity and our sense of well-being from a lot of external things a lot a lot of concepts as well a lot of mental concepts things like you know ambitions for the future uh, our sense of status or sen- our sense of achievement or success also our possessions <clears throat> are the people that we are close to and so on all of these things give us a sense of identity but when people go through intense suffering or loss these things are taken away from them the attachments are broken down and that actually brings about the transformation the, the collapse or the dissolution mm-hmm. of these attachments so the so what we can learn from that is that in our own lives we shouldn't be too dependent on external things the source of our identity and the source of our happiness should be internal you know rather than external so we we can learn to not be dependent on external things for our identity and another thing is um mortality you know contemplating death because a lot of people i spoke to underwent transformation largely through a an encounter with death you know becoming aware of the reality of death so but that's something we can all practice we know we can all remind ourselves of our, of our, our mortality and remind ourselves how how precious and how fragile our life is and and you know that those aspects can certainly um bring spiritual development so <clears throat> how similar when you talk about your state of awakening how similar is this state of awakening to that that's described as spiritual traditions for uh, buddhism uh, taoism or christianity in my view it's the same but it's uh it doesn't occur in the context in the context of spiritual traditions it's a kind of psychological state which is outside spiritual concepts and and traditions what well, what the way i see it is that um spiritual awakening is a kind of landscape it's it's, it's as if you're exploring a, a landscape of expansive human experience which is just beyond the range of normal human awareness so if you you know if you think about it there are so many different spiritual traditions around the world which are saying similar things so in a way you could say that they're exp- blowing the same landscape but in a slightly different way or they're looking at the landscape from different vantage points you know one of them is maybe at the top of the mountain somebody's next to the river but they're all on different you know they all have a different perspective but yeah. essentially it's the same landscape which is being interpreted and explored in different ways but the, the shifters who I talk about in my book they're exploring the landscape without you know the kind of pathways the pre-established pathways of spiritual traditions so sometimes it's harder for them because they don't have a framework to make sense of it they're kind of parachuted into this landscape without any warning you know <laughs> they're just thrown into this landscape and think wow oh, wow what is this place it's great but what's going on why am i here 
So they, they sometimes feel a little, a little bit confused. Mm -hmm. We're talking about extraordinary awakenings. Uh, if, if you know somebody out there that has had an extraordinary awakening, or if you know somebody that needs an extraordinary awakening, we're going to take a break. Uh, but when we come back, we're going to go much deeper into this. We're talking with, with the author of Extraordinary Awakenings, Steve Taylor. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Founded over 30 years ago to meet the needs of families in crisis, Westshield has continually focused on resolving issues that negatively impact families and businesses. Our signature therapeutic transportation service helps to ensure that adolescents in crisis are safely transported to specialized schools, programs, and treatment centers with unsurpassed experience and success. We are supported by our full service licensed investigation agency that has legally, professionally, and compassionately located hundreds of runaways and teens. We are experienced and qualified to help, offering solutions which may include referrals to our international network of top professionals in the fields of educational consulting, psychology, psychiatry, and investigations. Simply put, West Shield Adolescent Services and West Shield Investigations are the best solutions when your family is facing a personal crisis. Call 1-800-899-8585, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's 1-800-899-8585, or visit our website at westshield.com. Thank you. And we're back. We are talking about extraordinary awakenings. We have with us the author, Steve Taylor. And Steve, um, when we went to break, uh, you were talking about how people are looking at things just through a different landscape, but yet we're all sort of reaching transformation. Uh, you know, as we know, there's a lot of turmoil now out there that is being created. You know, I believe that the media creates more turmoil because it gets them more eyeballs, it gets them more ears. What are some of the things that we can do to reduce the noise or the turmoil that seems to be uh, forced on us uh, almost everywhere we go? I think it's very important to meditate. You know, I, I meditate every day. And one of the reasons why I love meditation is because it just empties my mind of all the information which is coming at me. You know, you know, and there's this kind of low level chatter which fills the mind. Part of it is, you know, thinking about the future, thinking about the past, but it's also the information we get from the world out there from media. And like it makes life seem complicated. You're thinking, oh, what if this happens? Should that happen? Should that have happened? There are all these different scenarios and possibilities running through your mind. So you start to feel a bit restless and a, a little bit confused, a bit disorientated. But if you sit down to meditate, you focus. I, I use a mantra. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I use a mantra or other techniques. But it, they always, it always has the same effect. You just empty your mind. Your mind becomes clear. And immediately this feeling of well-being begins to arise. This kind of natural feeling of stability and rootedness. And it's great because it, like, it feels like I'm coming home. You know, it's the place where I, I, I always should be. And I always am really beneath the, the clutter, which sometimes fills my mind. Um, but beyond that nature, I, I love to go into nature as well. It has it has a similar effect to meditation. You you just forget the silliness of the world and all the things that are going on out there. You just become one with your surroundings. You, you become one with the, the beauty of the trees and the hills and the sky and the sunlight. So again, life becomes really simple, which it is. Life is always really simple. It just seems complicated sometimes. Well, now I, I've created my own uh, mantra that works for me. And it sounds like you have yours. How would you say now you have a client that comes in and you're recommending that, that they get out into nature and that they do more meditation. Um, is there any special way that you work with them to create their own mantra that works best for them? Well, I, I sometimes try two basic meditation techniques. Um, you know, th there's like focus meditation, which is when you use a mantra, or sometimes I ask people to focus on their breathing. Mm -hmm. Maybe it depends on, you know, some people are more embodied than others. They're more connected to their bodies. And you can use, if that's the case, you can use the natural rhythm of the body, such as breathing, 
as a as a as a focus for the attention. Okay. Now, if if you could set up also a... some people prefer. An, an, no, Sorry, I, I was just going to say that some people prefer a more open, open focus meditation when you just, you know, it's like a Vipassana type meditation when you just mm -hmm. give your awareness to whatever arises, to whatever you experience, that can work well too. Okay. If you could set a curriculum for students, what would that curriculum be and what mm -hmm. age would you want them to go through it? Wow, that's a good question. <laughs> it would certainly include periods of quietness, mm -hmm. even silence. I think silence, there's not enough silence in the world. There's not enough quietness, especially in the modern world. But quietness is, is so important. You, you can connect with your own being in periods of quietness. You can connect with other people, even if, you're, even if you're not speaking to them. Sometimes you can connect more deeply with other people without, uh, by not speaking to them. So it would certainly include a daily period of quietness for one hour, at least one hour a day. It would inclu include um, periods of silent eating as well, because eating is, you know, it's a big part of our lives, but it's something we don't really pay attention to. But if you pay it, if you eat quietly and mindfully, it can become quite a powerful meditative experience. And, and also periods of contact with nature. I would I would uh, have an, an hour a day of compulsory contact with nature. <laughs> I, I'd like to do this, actually. Maybe I could, you know, if I became the UK prime minister, maybe I could introduce this one day. <laughs> OK, so the second part of that question is, at what age would you see or what grade would you see that uh, being brought in as part of a public school curriculum? At a young age, um, you know, from the age of five, I would say, you know, as soon as, as, soon as children start school, yeah. so everybody, it may be diff difficult for children to keep silent for an hour. That could be tricky, but they should certainly have contact with nature an hour a day. And, um, you know, even if you don't have silence, you could have a quiet period, you know, where they're not, where they have to whisper. But yeah, I think. I think young children are naturally spiritual to a degree because they, they have this amazing sense of wonder and this feeling of connection to the world around them. But I think they can be, they, they can be taught the benefits of quietness and mindfulness as well and contact with nature. Yeah, no, I, I like that. And I would love to see it start at about age five. And, and it would be interesting because if they made it a part of the curriculum, you could even have it as like any other subject you know, you know, if you take reading at age five, well, obviously you're going to take more reading classes at a higher level as you as you progress in school. Why not have the same thing with meditation or with something that calms the mind that that brings us a sense of peace rather than feel like you have to keep ramping everything up as they get older? Yeah, I think one of the problems with um, the standard education system in the US and the UK is that it's very competitive. It's, it's very achievement based and in anything that's very achievement based becomes more and more competitive, you know, but it just creates stress and it doesn't actually lead to high achievement anyway, because people become children become stressed and they become depressed and anxious. So it's kind of, it's counterproductive in the end. <clears throat> While we're on students, we have a question that's coming in. This one reads, um, uh, as, as a teacher at a very advanced thinking private school that teaches mindfulness uh, and has even introduced quantum physics, I occasionally introduce new books that would help prepare my students for life heading into the university setting and real life work. Uh, do you feel it would be suitable, a suitable read for our 12th graders and this is from natalie in virginia i think so yes yeah definitely i think um i think the extraordinary awakening is, is a very inspiring book because it makes you know it, it makes the reader aware of the amazing resilience inside human beings which we don't normally touch into in ordinary mm -hmm. life 
So I think for students, for you, for children, it can be it could be very inspiring, and it it could develop a more positive and optimistic view of human nature. It also, I mean, one one of my aims as a psychologist has always been to promote a, a more positive view of human nature, mm -hmm. because in in standard science and psychology, human beings are sometimes seen as like ruthless and evil biological machines, you know, competing and struggling against one another. But I think that's completely false. You know, th those elements are there, but I think altruism is more innate to human beings than than selfishness and you know ruthlessness. I think kindness is innate to human beings. Well, I completely agree. Unfortunately, those things don't seem to get the top ratings. No, they're <laughs> not very newsworthy. <laughs> and that's the problem, I think, is is that uh, you know it's it's the old term. I remember this going back to probably the 70s, which was the uh, the term was, if it bleeds, it leads. Right. And that was the concept of our new system, you know, was, you know, the, the, the more uh, horrific it can be, that's going to give it the lead, as opposed to if you bring out something that it's incredibly wonderful, that somebody did this incredible act of kindness, you know, that it brought so much joy to so many people, if it gets any coverage at all, it's on the back page. Yeah, that's right. Or occasionally, it used to be the custom here in England to end the news with one good story, one positive story, just a, a single one at the end. <laughs> we've given you, we've given you twenty horrible things. Now, here's a nice thing to end with. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, um, but if you think about it, you know, acts of kindness that they're such a part of everyday life, you know, when people compliment each other, they, you know, they step aside for or give way to one another, you know, they act politely or respectfully, you know, they're, they're, these acts are threaded throughout, throughout our everyday lives. And they're so normal that we don't often pay attention to them. Yeah. And, and I've noticed more of them. And I, I think in the very beginning of this, this COVID time that we're in, um, it seemed like that there was more anger because people didn't understand. But I felt that there's been more appreciation for those people that are now um, doing things to assist us. You know, so now there's greater appreciation, I think, for, you know, the retail worker, you know, or for the restaurant worker or for the people that are, you know, I think I think we now notice more about what they're doing as opposed to I think we may have gotten to a point to where we just kind of take it for granted that that's what they do. Um, so, I and, and so. I know, I know I feel more appreciative and, and I think I've seen it in others as well. I agree. I think, you know, I, I sometimes call it taking for grantedness, you mm -hmm. know, the human, uh, the human capacity to forget the value of things, to take things for granted, to, to fail to appreciate your good fortune or the value of the people around you. That's one of the, you know, it's one of the, mm, it, it causes so much kind of um, subtle discord and unhappiness in the world. But when, you know, sometimes it takes a reminder, you need to be reminded of the value of the people around you, the value of your health or the value of life itself. And it's, it's as if you suddenly wake up, you wake up out of your taking for grantedness and you suddenly realize, wow, I'm so lucky to be here and I'm so lucky to have these people in my life. I'm so lucky to be able to, you know, walk in the countryside and to look at the sky and to look at these trees. So suddenly you're filled with this sense of gratitude and, you know, life's the world seems like a different place. But, yeah, I think I think a lot of people have gained that through the pandemic. <clears throat> now, you, you just mentioned about, you know, a, a appreciating the people in our lives uh, and, you know, and as a, as a psychologist, you're, you're working with people. Um, in, in what situations do you find that you're also now sharing with either with clients or in general, people to be a little more cautious of who they keep in their life? In other words, at, at what point should people look around and say, you know what, there's a few people in my life that seem to bring on constant turmoil and maybe mm -hmm. I need to reevaluate just how much they're in my life. What's your thoughts on that? Again, I think um, 
that's one of the issues that people have been aware of, become aware of during the pandemic because they've begun to spend more time with their families. <laughs> yeah. And they, they, I think a lot of people have realized that they don't need that many people in their life. You know, like you say, Why? people have become more aware of the, the family unit and the, the joy that the family unit can bring, you know, the simple pleasures of eating together. The, the one which I really was really grateful for was um, going to the park with my kids mm. because during the first lockdown here in the UK, we weren't allowed to have any contact apart from our immediate families. So every, every evening or every day we went to the park to play soccer or to play other games or just to run around and be silly. And it was great, you know, I, I know, I've never spent so much time with my kids. And I think like, like other people during the pandemic, I've become aware that, you know, I don't actually need so much contact with people. I'm, I'm quite happy to, with my circle of immediate friends and my family and you know, that those intimate, deep relationships are, are very fulfilling. And the kind of superficial relationships which we sometimes have are not so important. And in, in actual fact, that's, um, that was one of my findings from my research was that people after spiritual awakening actually have fewer friends, which seems par paradoxical, but they have deeper and more intimate and authentic relationships with a, a smaller number of people. So mm -hmm. that, that, that was very interesting. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, so as, as I think we've got about four or five more minutes, um, what do you most hope readers will take away from, from your book, Extraordinary Awakenings? There are two main takeaways, I think. The first is one I've mentioned already. It's about being aware of the incredible resilience inside human beings. You know, it's quite breathtaking, breathtaking, you know, the amount of you know, the, the, the depth of soul power and inner strength which human beings have, which we only become aware of when we are faced, when we, you know, when we need it, you know, when, when we are faced with really traumatic situations. So it's, it's made me personally aware that, you know, I, I feel like I have a confidence that whatever I grow, go through in life, I will be able to cope with it and to transcend it because mm -hmm. that's, that's human nature. You know, we are incredibly resilient, but also, I hope that people have a more, a less resistant, resistant attitude towards crises and challenge challenges, because they do offer uh, the possibility of growth and transformation. They hold this kind of golden core of transformational potential, and you know, you know, they, they can change this for the better. No matter how painful they are, something good will come of them. All right. Well, Steve, thank you so much. Um, uh, Let's talk about some of the other things that you're doing, because I know you also, you know, you, you're also working with clients uh, and you're also a, a speaker. Um, what's the best way for people to get a hold of you uh, and or get a hold, you know, get the book? The best place to go is my website, which is stephenmtaylor.com. That's Stephen with a V, M for Mark, stephenmtaylor.com. And I have a lot of material on my website, a lot of links and a lot of uh, a lot of poems. I write poems, a lot of articles and lots of other things, a podcast as well. All right. And and but you also post like maybe where you're going to be speaking and things like that. That's right. Yeah. At the moment, I'm doing mainly online events. OK. Um, so, yeah, but there are there are links to my online events. And also, hopefully I'll be doing more more in-person events next year. All right. All being well. Well, if, if, if you're doing some over here in the U.S., let me know. Uh, I, I'd love to, to meet up with you there. So Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> so at this point, um, for, so, so for everybody out there, um, you know, this is, this is the type of, of website that you can go to. And again, if you're driving, you know, just go to answers.network. We'll make sure that we have Steve's information on our site. But... Um, you know, share this with some of your friends, because I think we all know somebody that's going through some form of, of trauma and they may not be as open to want to discuss it with with us, you know, with just anybody. But I think to be able to to sit down if they're not in some form of therapy or talking with professionals, this is another way that they can go. They can pull stuff off of Steve's website or send in questions. 
uh, I think there's another way that we can all help each other. So um, check it out yourself, share it with those people that you think uh, can, can bring great value from it. So Steve, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for writing the book. Uh, I think the timing is, uh, is, is even more beneficial because of what people are going through right now, that there is a lot more uh, anxiety and, uh, and trauma that people are dealing with. And uh, I think you give some great ways for people to, to kind of relax and, and pull away from that and really focus on what's important. So again, thank you. Thank you, Alan. It's been a, been a pleasure. Thank you. All right. And for everybody out there, please join us next Monday when Dale Gaboldo and Brian Gallinger will be with us. And they're going to be discussing Be Great. And this is something that I am also very familiar with, and it's one of the reasons that I was drawn to, to Brian, uh, because we're going to focus on what Be Great does, which is spotlighting humanitarians, advancing humanity, and empowering people to empower the planet. I mean, the planet. So, I mean, it's just, it's such a combination of win-wins that uh, you really want to listen and you really want to um, you know, share with other people. This is going to be quite a show that's going to really embody what we want on this show, which is how can we make a positive influence on the world? And that's exactly what Be Great does. So for everybody out there, please visit our archives of past interviews at answers.network or subscribe through the sh to the show through whatever podcast you listen to us on. Uh, if If you do and if they don't, have our show on there, ask them to add it. Uh, we'll be glad to. And remember, if you like what you hear, leave a review. Uh, it not only helps us reach more people, but we are greatly appreciative of that. The next time you're on Facebook or Twitter, please remember to stop by our page, I think, or Instagram as well. We're expanding. Uh, and check out some of our latest posts. Um, go to the website, check out some of our latest shows. And remember, if you like them, please like us and spread the word. And for everybody out there, until next week, be good human beings and make a decision to be great. Thank you. Hello, I'm Marty Cove. You might remember me from roles such as Sensei in the Karate Kid films. I've done over 100 films and countless stunts in my career, and I've always given 100%. With the damage done to my body over time, I needed to find relief from my chronic pain. My passion for health and fitness drove me to find a natural way to combat muscle pain. Teaming up with doctors, detectives, and a compounding pharmacist, we've created Marty's Cobra Cove Ultra Strength CBD Cream. It's the only thing that has been strong enough to knock out my pain. And fast. Honestly, you may have tried the rest, but it's time to try the best. It's legal, it's safe, and 100% effective. Show your pain, no mercy. Go to www.martyscobracove.com. You're listening to Answers Network with Alan Cardoza, only on LA Talk Radio.